Greetings. I am Daniel Stepner, Artistic Director of the Astid Magna Festival and Foundation. Welcome to the uh, final of our six virtual concerts this summer. Our program today celebrates Beethoven's 251st anniversary, thank you Mr. Covid, with music from the first and last decades of his unique career. After the 21-year-old Beethoven left Bonn permanently for Vienna in 1791, he produced a flurry of chamber works and sonatas. Among them was an incomplete duo sonata for viola and cello, composed in 1796 and reportedly played by Beethoven himself on the viola, and the Count Nikolaus Zmeschkal on cello. Zmeschkal, an Austro-Hungarian diplomat living in Vienna, had taken a liking to the young German composer, who was just then beginning to take Vienna by storm. They remained friends throughout Beethoven's life, and Zmeschkal was the dedicatee not only of this duet, but also the Opus 95 string quartet, composed 14 years later. Though 11 years older than Beethoven, Zmeschkal outlived the composer by six years. The duo's title is humorous and somewhat cryptic. The qualifier, with two obligato eyeglasses needs some explanation. The term obligato traditionally specifies a particular instrument for a given work. In this case, it also seems to have implied that both Beethoven and Zmeschkal were obliged to wear eyeglasses to see the music. Indeed, the manuscript from which they probably played is particularly hard to read. The movement you just heard, the only completed movement, of what was probably going to be a multi-movement work wasn't published until 1912, 115 years after its composition, and thus it has no regular opus number. Sketches for another movement exist, but are too fragmentary to attempt a completion. And a short minuet by Beethoven for the same combination of instruments, and in the same key, was found in the 1930s it may well have been intended as another movement for the sonata. So Beethoven's original intent might have been a four movement work, but if so, he apparently didn't take it seriously enough to finish it and to see it through to publication. The completed movement you just heard, however, is a substantial sonata form movement, well written for the duo. In the mid to late 1700s, there was a flowering one could truly say an eruption of music for string quartet, particularly in and around Vienna. A number of early opuses by ambitious young composers were sets of multi-movement string quartets. Composers such as Joseph Haydn, Carlo Ordonez, Dieters von Dietersdorf, Van Hal, Abrechtsberger, and of course, Mozart. Elsewhere, the ensemble inspired multiple quartets by François-Joseph Gosek and the Caribbean-born Joseph Bologna, 
both of them in Paris, Franz Xavier Richter in Germany, Josef Mislevicek in Italy, Johann Christian Bach in London, and Luigi Boccherini in Spain. Talk about expatriate multiculturalism. Boccherini, by the way, bequeathed us hundreds of chamber works, including 104 string quartets. Many of these composers were responding to the remarkable success of the early published quartets of Haydn, who is often credited with inventing the string quartet. This is not quite true, for isolated works for the traditional quartet existed before Haydn. He did, however, develop the form and ultimately composed 68 quartets over the course of his long life. Those works inspired Mozart, who composed 23 of his own, among his many other chamber works. Mozart's string quartets, especially the last 10, seem to me perfect works in every way. Six of these constitute a set that he dedicated to Haydn. String quartets are often published in sets of six, as were 11 different sets of by Haydn. These six packs seems to have been a throwback to the traditions of the earlier Baroque age. One need only think of J.S. Bach's Brandenburg and Charity, his cello suites, solo violin works, the French suites, English suites, and his keyboard partitas. Arcangelo Corelli published his trio sonatas and concerti grossi in multiples of six, as did Handel his concerti grossi, and Bach his, well, his, his uh, preludes and fugues for the well-tempered clavier. Perhaps this tradition was inspired by the Trinity, or perhaps by implication, one is allowed to rest on the seventh day. Given the striking standards of invention and beauty of sound in the quartets of Haydn, Mozart, and others, it is no wonder that the young Beethoven bided his time before presenting his first set of string quartets. In 1801, his first quartets, his first six quartets comprising his Opus 18 appeared in print. He was then 31. During the decade before, while training to slay this musical dragon, <laughs> he also composed piano trios, solo piano sonatas, and other instrumental works, including the duo you heard earlier, and five string trios for violin, viola, and cello. These five works include a standalone trio, his Opus 3, a six-movement serenade, Opus 8, and a set of three full trios that comprise his Opus 9. Beethoven had relatively few published models for his string trios, though Mozart had provided a sterling example late in his life with his Divertimento, Kirchhoff 563, which you may have heard on one of our earlier concerts this summer. Beethoven's Opus 9 string trios are polished, substantial works which lack nothing in musical weight. For the most part, they are well adapted to this tripod of an ensemble though there are many moments when one senses Beethoven's straining towards quartet writing, particularly in the frequent appearance of double stops among the parts. After his quartets appeared, he abandoned the string trio and, of course, went on to enlarge the scope and the spirit of the string quartet. Here is the third trio from his Opus 9. It is the most serious and substantial of the three. Of its four movements, three of them are cast in the dark, urgent key of C minor, the key of his fifth symphony, the third piano concerto, and three of his piano sonatas. The trio's slow movement is rather uncharacteristically set in the parallel key of C major. Take note of the first four notes of this work, played in unison by the whole ensemble. This motive will permeate the first movement is also lurking in the last movement and will have echoes later on in our concert in the Grosse Fuga, as it does in much of his late quartet writing some three decades later.
The four-note motive you just heard in the first and last movements of the trio is a pattern that Beethoven returned to, notably in his string quartets Opus 130, 131, and 132, and especially in the Grosse Fuga, heard last on tonight's program. In all these quartets, the motive is not just an occasional thing, but it is an essential organizing element in several dimensions. Beethoven manipulates the motive horizontally with extensions and contractions in time and vertically with variations in its intervallic structure. Sometimes the four notes of the motive are reordered. Sometimes only three of the four notes are sounded. And in the Grosse Fuga, the motive's many incarnations are heard against themselves in complex counterpoint. And yet this musical germ retains its audible identity. In Opus 131, it is not only the subject of, an, of a, the opening fugal movement, but is also writ large as the key scheme of the first four of its seven movements. The last five of Beethoven's 16 quartets, that is, the outsized so-called late quartets, were composed in the last two and a half years of his life, during which he completed no other music his fascination with the string ensemble's possibility and his willful expansion of the quartet's form are now legendary. Our program tonight closes with two movements from Beethoven's late quartet in B-flat, Opus 130. But before we play those two linked movements, we offer a tiny allegretto in B minor. This allegretto is an unpublished musical memento that Beethoven wrote in 1817 as a gift for an English visitor, Richard Ford. Nothing is known about their visit except that Beethoven also presented Ford with a signed engraving of his portrait. The 19-year-old Ford was then on the cusp of a career as a travel writer and became well known in his later years as a particular expert on Spanish art and culture through his Handbook for Travelers in Spain, published in England in 1845. The manuscript for this little quartet piece, lost for most of two centuries in Ford's family archives, turned up in a public auction in 1999 and was authenticated shortly thereafter. Like Beethoven's Bagatelles, Opus 33 and Opus 119, and like three quicksilver movements in the late quartets, whose extreme brevity seems incongruous in their larger context, this little allegretto is a complete piece of music 
It features a theme in imitative counterpoint, a tiny stretch of development that is climaxed by a unison passage and a cogent close. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. There, my comments about the Allegretto have lasted about twice as long as the piece itself. <laughs> the Cavatina and the Grossa Fuga that follow are the two final movements of the original version of Beethoven's Quartet Opus 130, the third of his late quartets. The contrast between these adjacent movements in length, mood, and intent could hardly be more dramatic. Now, the term cavatina seems to have a number of meanings, but it is usually understood as a short opera aria, usually without the da capo repeats of the traditional aria. The blustery first entrance of Rossini's character Figaro in the Barber of Seville is labeled a cavatina. You know, Figaro, 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 Figaro. In Mozart's Marriage of Figaro, which treats the same character in a more serious manner, there are three cavatini sung by three of the main characters. Here they are monologues, rather more inward. They are concise expressions of distilled emotion. Beethoven's purely instrumental cavatina in the B-flat quartet is a virtual aria, a musical soliloquy for the first violinist. It is certainly one of the most heartfelt of Beethoven's creations, with its warm outer sections in E-flat major, a favorite key of his, and perhaps particularly because of the hushed, halting, recitative-like middle section in the remote key of C-flat major. This short passage is marked beklempt, constricted, and seems to speak quietly of past suffering, before a return to the glowing sense of well-being which began the movement. In this regard, it bears a resemblance to the much longer, prayerful movement from his string quartet in A minor, Opus 132. The movement is entitled Heilige Dankgesang. The full title translates as Holy Song of Thanksgiving from a Convalescent to the Deity in the Lydian Mode. Beethoven himself had recovered from a life-threatening illness when he composed this tribute. The Lydian Mode, similar to a major scale with a raised fourth degree, was thought by some to have healing qualities. But back to our cavatina. The young violinist Karl Holtz, who played in the premiere of Beethoven's late quartets and who became the composer's confidant in his last years, reported that the cavatina cost the composer's tears in the writing and brought out the confession that nothing he had written had so moved him. In fact, merely to think of it brought, up, brought forth renewed tributes of tears. In its original context of the quartet, the final strains of the cavatina, carefully written to fade serenely into the ether, are rudely interrupted by the jarring unison onset of the Grosse Fuga, one of the most dissonant and audacious movements in all of Beethoven's output. Igor Stravinsky called it the most absolutely contemporary piece of music I know, and it will be contemporary forever. And the pianist Glenn Gould deemed it not only the greatest work Beethoven ever wrote, but just about the most astonishing piece in musical literature. So shocked were the listeners at the premiere of the Grosse Fuga by its dissonance, turbulence, mood swings, and length, that his publisher asked Beethoven to detach the fugue from the quartet, offering to publish it as a standalone work. Given that the fugal finale is so clearly a culmination of the five movements that precede it, in its disjunct qualities as well as its motivic relations and harmonic connections, it seems unthinkable that the famously headstrong composer would agree to this amputation. But after just one day's consideration, he did just that. He soon supplanted it in the quartet with a shorter, lighter movement, which was the very last music he was to complete. This relatively happy-go-lucky movement utterly changes the nature of the larger quartet. With Beethoven's blessing, the Grosse Fugue is published separately, shortly after his death, as Opus 133. Performers must decide how the B-flat quartet is to be presented, in its original form or in the composer-sanctioned revision. 
Personally, I feel that when the quartet's consummation, that is the grossa fuga, is denied, something precious is lost. The deliberately incongruous connection of the cavatina and the grossa fuga is broken, and the quartet loses its heft and its evocation of opera, of human drama. For just as the cavatina's title and ethos evokes the world of the musical stage, the fugue's opening section is marked overture, signaling the spectacle to follow. The extreme contrast between the two movements is part of that drama. This grand fugue, really four complex fugues in one, is based, as I've noted, on the same protean subject we heard at the opening of the C minor trio tonight. The fugue is a behemoth of a work that ranges from extreme violence in its dissonance and explicit accents to lyrical tenderness in its mellifluous, soft-focused sections. Sometimes there is almost no transition from one mood to the other. At other times, there is some rather silly traveling music resembling transitions between acts of a vaudeville show. This blithe music, in the end, becomes the basis of a wonderful, good-humored coda to the fugue. But the coda has its surprises, too. At one point, it dissolves and comes to rest quietly on a totally illogical harmony. And after a say-what silence, we suddenly hear the very first two muscular bars of the fugue again, the same opening we heard a quarter of an hour earlier. Beethoven, with a twinkle in his eye, seems to be threatening us with a huge reprise. But before we can roll our eyes, he breaks it off, as if to say, just kidding. And after a bit more groping around, finds his footing, restating the Ur motif in a full-throated unison before finally bringing the work to an end in a joyous romp. With these shenanigans all written into the music, Beethoven displays his gruff sense of humor, but also cannot hide his love and mastery of the old contrapuntal form of fugue, which offers him a platform for surprise. Fugue had intrigued him throughout his career, but it bore particularly fascinating fruit in his late works, in a cello sonata, two late piano sonatas, and in the late quartets, especially in this movement. Despite the fact that he agreed to separate the Grossa Fuga from the quartet, he clearly valued what it represented, enough to rework it for piano duet, the arrangement itself a large undertaking. In a draft for the Fugue's standalone string quartet incarnation as Opus 133, Beethoven added the words, somewhat free, somewhat studied, to the title, underlying the flexible nature of the fugal form. And indeed, Beethoven seems to exhaust the motivic and combinatorial possibilities of his material, much as Bach often does. It's hard not to think of this monumental work as both a tribute and a challenge to Bach, whose fugues Beethoven had studied since his youth in Bonn. Fugal sections are embedded within many of Beethoven's works, but in the thoroughgoing contrapuntal odyssey of the Grosse Fuga, he seems to be attempting to write his own Art of the Fugue. So then, after the little greeting card allegretto, we present the Cavatina and the Grosse Fuga as Beethoven originally intended them, as adjacent final movements of his late quartet Opus 130. Thank you so much for listening. Our other programs are still available through the Aston Magna website for your delectation at your convenience.
Thank mm-hmm. you.